Well, in this video, we're going to get to the climax. The climax meaning the top part. It's like it kind of builds kind of like this roof. By the way, this is not a typical roof, you know, that they had in the, uh, in the times of Jesus. It was more flat. But there is a point here that we're going to get to. Before we do, I'd like to discuss even further. I mean, I've gone on and on about these trials, but this is huge. This is the climax, the point of where Jesus is going to um, fulfill what his destiny was. His destiny, his reason, his purpose for coming on the earth was to die. His purpose was his purpose long ago when we discussed in the beginning of Matthew how he was in a manger, and that's more in Luke, but how his name was called Jesus to save us from our sins when that angel toward, told Yosef, Joseph, you know, the news. This is all, all this is hitting, heading for this point. It's a very important point. In this video, we're going to get into the top point, I would say, the climax, the major aha moment uh, that um, is in this set of scriptures. We're in Matthew, again, 26. And we're going to talk a little bit further about Caiaphas and, and that in which trial, what happened. And I've done a lot of thought about this, and I think I'm right in, the, uh, in what I'm going to suggest here. But let's, let's read this. Those who had arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the teachers of the law, the scribes, and the elders had assembled. But Peter followed him at a distance right up to the courtyard. We've already discussed this um, of the high priest. He went to the house. Uh, and the courtyard is where Peter will be. But we're not going to get to Peter just yet. That's coming up in these verses coming up here. And he entered and sat down with the guards to see the outcome. We'll get to him later. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin, or Sanhedrin, were looking for false evidence against Jesus that they could put him to death. We've discussed the witnesses. One after the other came over and over and just came in and came out, came in and came out. And I personally believe... Um, that that's where Peter heard the stories because they came out and just in good Eastern fast fashion in those days, uh, they probably sat around the fire too for a little bit warmed up and they were telling what was going on. The soldiers, the guards, the servants and all were sitting and standing around that fire where Peter was and, um, and they were telling what was going on. I think the soldiers and the people were saying, what's going on? What's going on? How, how's the trial going? You know, there was a lot of curiosity, and Peter was there, who was very curious on what was happening, too. He was like, oh my goodness, what, what are they doing to Jesus? His heart was just, oh, I feel so, so much uh, um, sympathy, and oh, my heart goes out to Peter, because here he is, and he's probably hidden more, and, and all that. But anyway, um, we'll get to the stories later, but that's how he found out the stories, and that's how he could tell Mark, and also Luke probably... Uh, you know, talk to Mark, I mean, Peter, because he did a lot of investigation and, and uh, like interviews and all that. So he got all this information probably from Peter. John was in there too, so I'm not sure exactly. Bible doesn't say where he was very much. He was probably inside there, maybe in the, in the background of the trial, maybe he heard some of it too. He spoke a lot of different uh, uh, details in the book of John and John 18 and all. But anyway, uh, finally, you remember the two witnesses finally came up and they had, this is actually recorded their testimonies. The others, we don't have no idea. Nobody knows all the testimonies of all the witnesses of what, well, he said this, he did this. No, he didn't. He did. <laughs> Just all these arguments and all. Nobody was uh, hitting it right and saying different things, contra contradicting each other. Oh, the, the Kai office and the others are like rolling their eyes probably. Oh my goodness, well, this is not going the way we were hoping. And uh, this went on and on for hours, most likely, I think, or at least an hour or two. I don't know. It went for, I think, for quite a while. And, um, and the one testimony that they come up with was the idea of, you know, the temple being destroyed. And one of the, things that they, the, the lies that they said is they said that one of the witnesses said that Jesus said, I will destroy this temple. He never said that. He didn't say, I'm going to destroy it and build it up again in three days. <laughs> By the way, he's talking about the body, the, his human body. It was, a, it was a riddle. It was very cool. We'll get into that in, John, in the book of John because it comes up very, very clearly, and that's where that was described. And, excuse me. And so, you know, 
they said that he he said that I was going to destroy. I am I'm going to destroy, and I'm able to rise, build it up again. Like that was crazy in their minds. You know, 46 years that temple had been built, and it was built way longer. It kept going, but up to that point, excuse me, it was literally built for 40 46 years. Then we get to this climax here, and this is what uh, I think once the witnesses were over, they had no more. They were like, oh my goodness, what do we do? Well, here's where I'd like to bring in the, this chart again, this outline. I think what happened is that this is where the witnesses were. Caiaphas and others and the Sanhedrin was in there. That's the others and witnesses and everything else that was happening here. And then finally, it was kind of like, well, no more witnesses. What do we do? Finally, he, he had a pointed question to Jesus. I think this is in the second trial. And I'm going to mention what happens, I think, in the third, tri third trial. This happens, and then he gets, like, like hurt and beat up and everything in this, after this thing. And by the way, I mentioned that it was the servants and all, but maybe some of these could have stayed behind and hit him too. I don't think so. The judges probably wouldn't have done that. But who knows? They had such a hatred to him, uh, of him. And they did uh, show their, that same Sanhedrin uh, showed hatred to Stephen and they took him and maybe their servants also took him out and they stoned him to death. They gnashed their teeth, it says in, in the book of Acts. I think it's Acts 8. Anyway, all this this team, so maybe some of them, some of them definitely did some violence to him. Maybe even the Sanhedrin, Sanhedrin, I'm not sure, but I think it's all here. The climax happened here. And then they came back later, and I just want to mention this. It's not perfectly clear, but you kind of put all this together. Um, it says at the break of day, at the end of day, this is, I think Luke said this, it says that they came together, the council. And then Luke mentions the story of what happened here. Um, and by the way, Luke obviously put the three denials of Jesus together and then he did this. He didn't necessarily put it exactly in order except that it was at the end of day that they came together again. And I think, I mean, it's possible that that's when that climactic question happened or it's possible that they kind of brought it up again and maybe Jesus was standing there while they talked or they kind of talked about how, what's our plan. That's when they came on the third one and Jesus was maybe in that trial again. He was actually in the trial probably right there um, or maybe not. And he, uh, they kind of planned this whole thing. Maybe they actually asked him again to make sure. No, I don't think so. I think they just literally d figured out the plot, the plan on how we're going to bring him to Pontius Pilate, the procurator or governor of Judea at that time, and how we're going to try and figure out how we can convince him to execute him, to put him to death. Anyway, it's very interesting. So I think it could be the second trial that this happened. And let's get to the climactic question here. And so finally, the pointed question in the mind of Jesus, in the mind of Caiaphas, this, this is the big thing. This is their big question. And it's in my uh, writing there, the idea of, are you the Christ, the Son of God? You know, the quote, the Son of God. Um, so this is, this is what happened. Um, they, he asked this question point blank to Jesus. It's like taking an arrow and flinging it, hitting the bullseye. And he said, I adjure you. And I, in other words, I charge you, I command you to answer. Oh, I do want to emphasize this, that after all those witnesses, I missed this part. He said here, um, I'm not sure if it's in Matthew here. I think it is. Um, yeah, then the high priest stood up and said to him, are you going to, are you not going to answer? Yeah, so he literally said, are you not going to answer this? And he just stood silently. Jesus was in command, <laughs> really. Very cool. Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent. Like he didn't say anything at this point. He just stood there quietly. Now, I don't know if his head was down or he just looked at him. He didn't answer. Ooh, that just like, what a presence. Like so cool. Why didn't he answer? Well, um, he, you know, it was a bunch of conflicting stories. Uh, he didn't, he wasn't trying to defend himself. He put his life, his soul in God's, by the way, the Bible says that in the second, in first Peter, he trusted God. He committed himself to 
God who judges righteously. Sometimes, now remember this, you're going to go through some times that's really sticky and tough. Sometimes they're really difficult. You say, oh no, how am I going to get out of this? He just trusts God that judges righteously. And over the centuries, many, many Christians have been martyred and killed and sacrificed. Even kids gave their lives to Jesus uh, because they decided to trust in God who judges righteously. In other words, he's going to have the last word and vengeance is his and he will repay and all that. But anyway, so here it is. He basically was saying, I adjure you are under the oath, under oath by the living God. It literally says, I adjure you by the living God. Yahweh, God, the great God of heavens and the earth, the God of the Jews, the God of the world, you know, under oath by the living God. Now, when he said under oath, in other words, almost saying, do you swear to say this? You're going to have to answer me now under oath. You're in this court case. You got to answer this. And then Jesus did decide to answer. And this is a point that's all the way to the top right here, where Jesus literally at this time confessed that he was the Christ. Absolute answer. See, up to that point, he's, it's been shady, like like uh, um, in the shadows. He's alluding to it, his riddles, a lot of things, but he didn't really say, I am it. Here's where he actually said it, because he knew that would be it. That's That would clinch it. Here's, here's, here's how it went. Uh, under oath by the living God, are you the Messiah, the Meshach? The Christos is a Greek. Christ, are you the one that the Bible has predicted for hundreds of years? Are you the Old Testament one that's mentioned? Are you that one? They wanted to, you know, get him to confess that. And, and, and the Son of God. Now, in the Jewish understanding of Son of God, it's not the same understanding as a Christian understanding of Son of God. Son of God, although they kind of did think that's what he was saying, but when they said Son of God, I think they were saying a title. The Son of God is like um, the same thing I would say as the Messiah. Uh, there's like Israel is called my son. God called him my son in Hosea, for example, and other places, not very many places, but Israel is his son, the adopted son. You know, it's like it's a it's a name of being we belong to God um, the, and that he's our father, so to speak. Um, now, Mark mentions that he says the blessed one, and they could have, he could have said both, but whichever, you know, it's just, you know, okay, son of God or the blessed, or uh, yeah, of the living God, um, he said right here, let me read it from the Matthew passage, I charge you under oath by the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the son of God, or the blessed one, you know, uh, is what, he, uh, what um, Mark mentioned. And so this is the big question right here. See that question mark? This is it right here. And, and because he had to answer in, in the Old Testament in the law, it literally says they had to answer this question. I think it's a Deuteronomy, by the way. Um, <clears throat> and the Son of God, like I said, equals the Messiah. Um, so, you know, here comes the, the verdict here of what's going to happen. And uh, Jesus said this, and I'll read it out of this. This is very cool. He said, <clears throat> yes, it is as you say. Now, the King James Version of the Bible says that you have said it. So some people think, ah, but he didn't really say that he was the one, that that is who I am. But really, in, in the understanding of the Greek and everything, it really is an affirmative. It's a yes, that's it. Or how, how, it's like saying this, you said it. That's what that means right there. It wasn't like, well, you've said it. See how I'm saying it? Uh, the, the, the shade and the meaning in the, of, the, of that Greek word underneath that is you said it. Like, yep, that's it. You, you said it. it. It was even out of his own lips, Caiaphas, that he's saying who he was, kind of almost declaring it. Well, it was a question. But he said, you said it. Now, I love Mark, by the way. It, and Mark has two words. It literally said, I am. So it means the same thing. But Mark said, I am. That's what that meant. Like, yep, I am. He literally said, I am. And so that's kind of cool that he just puts it right out there. Um, and so at that point, um, well, let's, let's, let's think about this for a second. Uh, he had three things he could have done here. He could have done no answer. He could have just refused to answer, like just stood there silently again. But if he did that, he's sort of like breaking the law because it was a rule 
that if you are adjured by the an oath or something that you are demanded to give an answer to this Supreme Court judge, the high priest judge, the highest judge there, um, then he's kind of breaking the law if he doesn't answer at this point. Now, if he would have said, no, I'm not, he would have saved himself. Um, he could have gotten out of there and maybe been flogged a little bit, whipped a little bit. I don't know. Not, I don't know. Maybe nothing. And, but he would have lost. First of all, he'd be lying. Um, he would be safe, but it wouldn't be true if he said, no, I'm not the Messiah. No, I'm not the Christ. It, it, it's not true because he is. And so he, he could have lied right at that moment, fibbed. Um, but he would have saved his life. Like, he would have been no sweat. He would have gotten out there. But then uh, his influence would have, he would have no influence, you know, on, on the people and everything. He would just be one of these guys like others who tried to lead Israel astray, like Thudas or something. There's a guy named Thudas who led 400 people uh, to, you know, in the wrong direction. There's another guy later in the, who came, he had 4,000 people or so of uh, of. Of, of Jewish people who led him to the Jordan River and he said, I'm going to split the sea. He was deluded and, and there was a big slaughter. The Romans killed those. So different people had come in those, in those time periods, rough, turbulent times and, uh, and professed to be the Messiah and the Christ and went down. Didn't happen. So, or if he would have said yes, which he did, <laughs> he said, I am. Uh, then it, it would have been sure, certain death or at least an attempt to get death. Uh, by convincing, uh, uh, like, Pilate, the governor here, that he, he's, it's worthy of death here. But he knew that he was headed for death, and he knew that was his calling, and he said yes. Jesus, with the power of the Spirit of God, has such courage. And many millions of Christians have died over the years, and even now today, they're still dying for the name of Jesus. Um, on stakes, burning, crosses, um, even 11 out of the 12 apostles were all killed uh, believing in Jesus Christ. So it, it's wonderful. Um, you say it's wonderful. Yeah, death is good. <laughs> death is a good thing because you enter right into the presence of God and you're standing up for Jesus. And he died for me. Uh, wow, what an honor to be able to die back for him. So anyway, but he said yes, and he knew he was going to die. Um, now, they would, if he did say yes, they wouldn't have believed that he was a Messiah. They, he must not be the Messiah. I mean, he's imprisoned here. He's bound up with ropes. Uh, he's weak. Uh, and by the way, the Bible says Jesus died in weakness, was crucified in weakness. It seemed like he was weak and all that. But the weakness of, of, of Jesus was actually the strength of God, his strength and the power of humility and love and oh, so much here. He must not be the Messiah if he said yes. Um, and, and also that he would not be fulfilling prophecy. See, they were confused on, on what the Messiah was supposed to be. Not completely half of it or a lot of it, maybe even more than half. There's scriptures in the Old Testament talking about him putting down all his foes, his enemies, uh, bringing peace to the world and everything. And it still hasn't happened. We've discussed that quite a bit. The kingdom of God is here, but not yet. Um, Jesus Christ hasn't put down wickedness and evil and have the judgment day and everything. And so the picture of this Messiah in this carpenter, this guy from Nazareth, you know, from the backwoods of Nazareth, backwaters of Nazareth and this little town, maybe 175, 200 people, maybe. And in Nazareth, can anything good come out of Nazareth, Nathaniel said. And there's so much here saying that, nah, you're not the Messiah. They didn't believe that. They didn't believe he was a Messiah. Or they believed it and they just stopped their ears and they didn't want to go that route because they would lose their influence and power. And we've discussed why they didn't like him as much. They not just didn't like him, they hated him. They wanted to put him to death. But that uh, yes would have been, I uh, see you're not the Messiah. That's what their uh, probably arguments, whether honest or dishonest, were. Well, it seemed like he was trapped. I mean, he had one of three things to do. And so if he's not going to do this one, he's supposed to do it. He's supposed to answer. He's not going to say no, because that would be lying. It, it was trapped. It was, a, it, was a, it was a snare. It was a trap. So it seems. And in one sense, yeah, he had no other option but to tell the truth there. Um, however, 
Jesus is never trapped. And it was all purposed and planned and fulfilled that Jesus would do this for us. What a wonderful Savior. Um, I could go on more on this, um, but I think that's it. Well, let me just re reiterate the fact that, oh, no, let's read what happened. Then he literally tore his um, outer garment. I don't have a garment to tear, but he, he tore his garment. He took this thing, his outer garment. You can, you're not supposed to tear the high priest's garment. The Bible forbids that, by the way, in the Old Testament. There's a scripture that says that. But he wasn't in his breastplate with the uh, 12 stones and, and the, the former wear, but he tore his outer garment and also it's the inner garment, even the tunic or the under thing, under thing. He tore that, ripped it. People were like, oh, wow. Um, why did he do that? He tore the inner too, the inner one. The reason he did it is because there is a passage in the writings of the Jewish people that literally said that if someone blasphemes, speaks against the name of God, or says something evil like this, to that degree, the sacred name of God, and he never even spoke against the name of God, but he's, he's claiming to be like right up there with God, being the Messiah and the King and the Son of God. And, the, and oh, he said the Son of Man, which is Daniel 7, and that is definitely one that is beyond just a human being. Even if it says Son of Man, I've already discussed that actually, but Son of Man is the favorite title that Jesus used of himself, and it's because he's using it from Daniel 7. If you read in Daniel 7, somewhere around 13 and 14 or something, like he's, he's escorted in the presence of God. He's going to sit at the right hand of God. And that's what Jesus said, by the way. Let me read it. It says, I am, or as you said, he said, but I say to all of you, from henceforth, in the future, now and after this, like in the future, um, it says, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One. <laughs> like, you're going to be exalted to that position right by God, God. Um, yeah, and that's definitely Psalm 110. You know, that's, that's a passage that is mentioned that. Uh, that he's showing that one and Daniel 7. So he says, I say unto you uh, in the future or henceforth or from now on or coming up here, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. That is definitely talking about Daniel 7. It's, it talks about it there. Um, then that's when he tore his thing. So here it is. He finally said, not only I am, but you're going to see this. You guys are going to see this. <laughs> they got mad. He got mad. He ripped that thing. That was blasphemy. Well, let me read on. I'll just, because I got to continue. And he says, why do we need any more witnesses? That's what they were trying to do. See, and it, it, it irked them. It got them angry that Jesus wouldn't speak because they were trying to find something that he said that, they, aha, we got you. And what you said, well, there it is right there. Hook, line, and sinker. Boom. We got you now. We got you around the throat, so to speak. He said, why do we need no witnesses? Look, now you have heard his blasphemy. And then, what do you think? Now, at this point, they went into the typical court language that they would do. It was a formal court, very informal court this is. To life or to death? For life or for death? And they would say, for life or for death. And then they would usually, in a tr true court case, they would start with the youngest. And each of the members of the, in that semicircle that I talked about last time, uh, would give their vote whether he should die if the person's guilty or not guilty. And uh, it, it, it doesn't seem like he did this at all, um, unless they just skipped out one by one, but they all just, a majority of them, or all of them. Who knows, there could have been Joseph, I've mentioned that he probably wasn't there, Joseph of Arimathea, and also Nicodemus, is some good people in the Sanhedrin, it, it seems like, San, has Sanhedrin. Um, and they, they, they just, I don't know if he was, they were there or not. They could have kind of tried to say something and they didn't agree, but it was a majority or something. Um, I don't know. They, uh, they said he's worthy of death. And then uh, that's when they probably left at this time. And then some of them may have hit him themselves, but, or the servants and the soldiers, I think under the orders of the high priest or the other priest, um, Anas may have been back, right, back back here, we don't know, or maybe he wasn't. I'm not sure he sent him. It doesn't sound like he escorted him over there with them. Uh, but anyway, and then, um, then we get into something else that happened at this time, which is very cool. 
and that's coming up with Peter. Not cool in a sense because what he did, but wow, wait to hear some of this in that story. I think I'll end there. Otherwise, I'll just keep going on and on and thinking of more things about this really wonderful and rich study and really rich story. And thank God for Jesus, his humility and his his servant attitude and, um, you know, just really beautiful. Amen. All right. Well, thanks for listening. God bless you.